A mother can never forget. Isaiah 49, 13 through 16, notice from God's word. It says, but Zion said, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Have you ever thought that? Well, verse 15 continues. It says, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she would have no compassion on the sons of her womb. Even these may forget, yet I will what? Not forget you. I will not forget get you. Behold, I've, him, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The first part of Isaiah 49, you have a powerful promise. Read it. Isaiah 49, verses 1 all the way through to verse 13. You have a powerful promise of Israel's coming salvation immediately from Babylon. But then not just there, it points to the ultimate deliverance that, I, that Israel will experience when the Messiah comes and ransom his people and he makes all things new. But then we come to this verse 14. And this is what Israel says to God's message of deliverance. They say, but Zion says... But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Now, Zion was a hill in Jerusalem where the tabernacle was. Now, the tabernacle had tons of significance, but one of the most significant things about the tabernacle was it was a place on earth where God dwelled. But then the temple's destroyed. And so Israel says, because of what happens to Zion, the Lord's forsaken us. The Lord has forgotten us. He doesn't care. After he declares his love to his people, they essentially respond, well, I don't feel loved. You see, friends, what Israel is feeling in verse 14 is something we all feel. Lord, I've heard your promises, but I don't feel your promises. God, I've I've, I've seen your promises in your word, but I'm not seeing your promises in my life. Okay, okay, pastor, you say that God's going to deliver me, but when? You say that God loves me, but how? And so today, friends, we're going to look at three things very quickly in this chapter, verse, uh, chapter 49, verse 14 through 16, we are going to see in verse 14 the painful question we've all wondered or asked in our lives. Two, we're going to look at verse 15, which is God's answer to the question. And then verse 16, we're going to see the cure for the pain. Friends, could you use some cure for some pain today? Jesus is the cure for the pain. First, let's look closely at this painful question. It says, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. But in verse 14, Israel doesn't, you see, verse 1 through 13 is all about God's love. But then in verse 14, Israel doesn't feel loved. They're saying God's deliverance may eventually come, but what about now? Just as sometimes we can think, you know what, I've heard Jesus is coming soon all my life, but what about the pain I'm experiencing today? I know that one day he's gonna, I'm going to see that loved one again that has died, that seemed to be just ruthlessly snatched from my hands. I know I'm going to see that loved one again, but, but I'm lonely today, God. I feel forsaken, forgotten. I have needs now. I'm surrounded by needs now. You see, the temple reminded, God, reminded God's people that he loved them, but now that Zion's gone, they're no longer sure of his love. Lord, I knew you loved me when I had a job. But I'm not so sure now that I've lost my job. Okay, God, I know that you loved me before the felony conviction, but can you still love me after the felony conviction? Because if you really loved me, you wouldn't let all these bad things keep happening to me, right? I mean, if you wanted to step in, you could. How do I know you love me? Even in times of hardship and trial and pain. You see, friends, verse 14 is is, is dealing with this fundamental question. It's a fundamental human condition, and that is we can live in the presence of truth. We can even believe in truth that's in the word of God, and yet it not impact the way we live. 
We can believe in a liberating God, but not feel liberated. I mean, how many of us have said, I believe Jesus is coming soon, but it doesn't shape our lives? How many of us have said, I believe in a loving God, but we live as though there is a God that is looking for any chance he can to just zap us? How many of us have said, I'm a child of God, and yet we feel completely orphaned and abandoned? You see, we may hear all kinds of good stuff at church, stuff that points to deliverance, things that point to second coming, things to point to to one day when we'll be free, but there seems to be this inner thought that says, yeah, but what about now? That just with every message of deliverance and salvation that we hear, there seems to be just as many things inside our hearts and outside us that condemn us and say otherwise. We look inside of our hearts and we say, there's no way God can love me with that in my heart. We look inside of us and we we think there's no way God could possibly live in me while that is in me. I don't know if God can ever possibly forgive me for what I've done. But not not only does our own heart sometimes condemn us, but things outside of us condemn us. Things happen to us every day. We live in a world that, that, that exists contrary to a message of deliverance and salvation. Unanswered prayers, deteriorating health, um, pain and, and famine in the world, emotional and mental turmoil, financial debts, job problems, family po- problems, world problems, marital problems. Okay, God, I know you said you're in control. Why is it I feel so out of control? I mean, I need you now. I need you now when my family's falling apart. What about now when I can't make that house payment? What about now when I am so depressed I can't even get out of bed in the morning? What about now, God, when my son is still alive? I don't want to lose my son. And friends, often we cry out like Martha when Jesus showed up three days after Lazarus had died and we shake our fist at God and we say, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know you're coming back, Jesus, at the end of this age, but what about now when I need you most? Friends, it is possible to believe that you are a child of God in your brain without feeling it in your heart. And that's why our faith has to become more than just an adherence to doctrine, amen? Friends, our faith has to become more than just an adherence to doctrine. It has to be an encounter with God's grace, which is our reason and motivation for believing and accepting in his doctrines. And this is why. We need a faith that will melt our hearts. Why? Well, because otherwise, every time something bad happens, we'll cry out, we'll shake our fists at God, and we'll say, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Because I'm doing all these things just like you said for me to do, and now you've abandoned me. But friends, in those cases, you were serving a God like a a checkoff grocery list. You think God owes you just because you're doing these things. No, you owe God everything. That's why you do them. And that's why our faith has to be more than just an adherence to doctrine. It has to melt our hearts. We have to go from thinking that God loves us and and reading that God loves us to knowing that God loves us. Is College Drive reflecting a love that reveals to people that they know God loves them? You see, sometimes we are the only thing that is, is the difference between someone knowing whether God loves them or not. So this is the question. The good news is God has an answer for your question today. Let's look at the answer now. We've looked at the question. Let's look at the answer. Let's read this out loud together, friends. We need to let this sink into our hearts. Isaiah 49, verse 15. Read it aloud with me, okay? Let's do it. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may, what? Yet I will not forget you. You see, to our question, Lord, have you forgotten me? God says, never. Never 
And to prove it, he compares his love to one of the most intimate actions in the world. It's one of the most intimate displays of love in the world. And he he compares his love for you and me with the love of a nursing mother. It's a powerful scene. You see, guys, there is a special bond between a mother and her child. It's not just emotional and mental, but man, the thing is physical. And as as involved as we dads are in the raising up of our kids, and as unique as our relationship is with our kids, guys, there's just some things we cannot do, right? I mean, think about it. A woman can actually grow a baby inside her body. And then nine months later, she actually delivers that baby through her body. And then she can feed the baby with her body. Guys, it doesn't matter how unique your relationship is with your child. There's some things you just can't do. Moms have a connection. And it's mental, it's emotional, it's even physical connection with their babies. And it's to this that God's comparing himself in Isaiah. Let's look at three reasons very quickly. Three reasons a mother cannot forget her child, okay? First, a mother can't physically forget her child. Because you see, when a mother's nursing, even if the child forgets to eat, even if the mother forgets to feed the child, the mom's body doesn't forget. In fact, it becomes incredibly uncomfortable for the mother if she doesn't feed the child because of something called prolactins. Are you guys impressed with my scientific knowledge? It makes it uncomfortable for the for the mom. Uh, She's got to feed the baby. So even if the baby forgets and the mom forgets, man, the body doesn't forget. Nature, her physical nature, moves her to her child. Secondly, moms cannot emotionally forget her child. You see, nursing a child doesn't just affect a mother physically, but also emotionally, because it releases this hormone called oxytocin. It's a chemical released in the woman during childbirth and during one other time. That is the nursing of a baby. And this hormone actually makes mom feel delight, a source of inner peace and joy, and it is especially released when she looks at the child. It gives her this inner satisfaction that that, that can't be given by anything else. And so she cannot emotionally or mentally forget her child. However, not only is mom's love emotional and physical, but it's also unconditional. Let's compare the relationship of a mother and baby with the relationship between spouses, okay? Or a boyfriend and a girlfriend, or whatever your context is. You know, and and when we get married, we, we say all these vows, and we try to commit to some level of unconditional love, but the reality is uh, there has to be give and take in a marriage, Right? You cannot survive if one person is completely, absolutely unconditional. You have to have give and takes in a marriage for it to last. Otherwise, it will unravel every time. Now, what about the relationship of a baby and a mom? Are there gives and takes in that relationship? Yes. Mom, all give. Baby, all take. Seriously, what do moms get from an infant? Nothing, except for some sleepless nights, right? Moms don't get anything, and yet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, their life revolves around that baby. You know, I've seen a lot of babies in my life. I've seen a lot of beautiful babies in this church. And you know, when you're, I, I always, you know, when, whenever I've had a, 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 one of my children and you know, you're, you're there and, and you're looking in the nursery, that freshly born baby is so beautiful. And you look at that baby and, and you know, your, your, your eyes start to drift over to that n- neighboring baby. And you think to yourself, and that's kind of a goofy looking baby. <laughs> you know, you're like, my baby is gorgeous. <laughs> that, that baby's funny looking. And what you don't realize is is the guy standing by you is thinking the same thing about your baby. (laughs) My dad had this endearing joke he used to always say to me. He'd say, Richie, 
You got the kind of face that only your mama could love. I hope it was a joke. <laughs> and, and, but there's some truth to that. I mean, I don't care how goofy looking a baby is. And, and again, there's no goofy looking babies in this church. Amen? Amen. And that's right. That's what I wanted to hear. But, but, but again, to a mom, man, there's nothing more beautiful than their baby. I mean, how consistent and unconditional and indestructible is a mother's love towards her, 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 her infant? And it's to this type of love that God is saying, this is my love for you, just infinitely times greater. And that's why he says, even these may forget, yet I will never forget. Interestingly, the Hebrew doesn't say they may forget. If you read the actual original text, it actually says they will forget. You see, friends, as great as, the, as, as a mother's love, as, as, as great as and, and as powerful as the, the prolactins and the oxytocins are, moms still make mistakes. Moms still mess up. Sadly, there are even bad mothers in the world. Not everyone here today has had a great experience with their mother. And sadly, man, even some mothers have abandoned their children. You know, C.S. Lewis always had a hard time with this concept, not for a mom, but for a father, this idea of having a heavenly father because his father was very abusive. But the good thing is, is God is everything that our mothers and our fathers have not been. Friends, there are even bad mothers out there, but even if your mother is the greatest mother in the world, even she's going to grow old. Even she will grow senile. Even she, if the Lord doesn't come beforehand, will eventually die. It's a result of sin. See, as great as our mother's love is, it still will fall short. But God is saying, my love will never fall short. Yes, a mother's love moves her physically and emotionally and unconditionally towards her child, but my love moves me infinitely more towards you. You see, I didn't just cross the room to come to you at night when you were sleeping. No, I crossed the universe to come to you when you were dead in your sins and trespasses. I didn't just lose some sleepless nights for you. Man, I died for you. I lost my life. Look at a nursing mother. Not too close. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. But... <laughs> Look at her face as she looks at her child. Friends, it glows with, with a radiant joy towards the child. And God is saying, that's my love for you just infinitely times more. In verse 14, Israel thinks the Lord has forsaken them because the temple's been destroyed. But essentially God responds, you know what, that's a building. I can forget buildings, but I can't forget you. Look, we can rebuild buildings. Buildings are replaceable, but not my love for you. Not my love for you. And so God says, don't compare my, my eternal and internal love for you with externals around you. Friends, we got to stop doing that. Stop comparing God's eternal and internal love for you with externals around you. Stop comparing your insides with other people's outsides because God could care less about that stuff. I care about you, is what God says. I'm more fixed on you than a nursing mother is fixed on her child. Friends, the unconditional commitment for, of a mom for her baby is only a sliver of the unconditional commitment God has for you. That's what God is telling Israel and he's telling us today. When God is comparing him, his love for us with the unconditional love of a mother, do you realize what he's saying? Do you realize what he is saying? He's saying you add nothing to this relationship. You give me absolutely nothing. You are only a liability in this relationship. The only thing you give me is being a source of my love and adoration. It's all take, take, take with you, but I still absolutely treasure, love you, and adore you, and I will forever and ever. 
Don't you see? He didn't create, create us so that we could give him love because he already had that. He already had that throughout eternity. Uh, but he created us then so that he could give us love. I already had love before you, Richie. I just want to give you love. I am love. And I don't care if based on the world's standards you're not beautiful because based on my infinitely God's standards, you are the most beautiful thing in the world because I created you and I actually made you to look like me. Friends, can you imagine what would happen to this church if we really believed this? I mean, if we really experienced this kind of love, what do you think would happen? What kind of person do you think we would be? I can answer it for you because I know I would be a completely different person than I am standing here today. Because you see, we would have a joy and an an inner satisfaction that no pain or circumstance could ever take away. Man, you, we would stop going to these empty wells for fulfillment. We would stop doing this vicious cycle of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. You would stop worrying about so much about what's on the outside because you would know that God loves you for what's on the inside. You would never question his timing, his plan, or his will because the reality that he loves you and would never do anything to harm you has ceased being a theory and it has become your greatest reality. Okay, pastor, that sounds good. But I mean, isn't this still just talk? I mean, isn't this still just you saying, yeah, God's going to deliver me, one, you know, maybe one day, but, but, but I need his love now. What about the pain? What about the disease? What about the depression I have today? You've given me an answer to my question theoretically, but I need something more than theories. I need a solution to the pain. And you know, the reality is, is we don't know true love until we see it, do we? You do not know true love until you see it. Because until love becomes more than words and becomes an action, it's still just words. I I can tell my kids all day that I love them. I can tell my spouse that I love her. I can tell you, my, my church family, that I love you all day. But unless you see it, it's not love. It's empty words. Friends, today we've seen the question. God's given us the answer. Now in verse 16, he gives us the cure for the pain. Isaiah 49, 16, powerful. It says, behold, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. You see, friends, as physically draining as a child is when they're an infant, man, that doesn't hold a candle to how physically draining they become when they're teenagers, right? Or, or even when they're five years old. Why? Well, because children never seem to realize just how much you love them. Kids never seem to realize just how much you've sacrificed them. You see, sometimes I know that, that my parents are the closest things I have seen physically as, as God because my parents have given me more in my life than I could ever possibly repay. And that gives me just a little snapshot of of God and his grace. But think about it. it, it's draining because children never seem to realize how much we love them and sacrifice for them. As far as a five-year-old is concerned, we do exist primarily to take care of their every need. And you know what, sometimes even I have to remind my kids, you know, I know the sun seems to rise and set over your head, but you're not the center of the universe. And in those times when we have to put our foot down and we say, you know what, you can't have that. No, you cannot do that. And no, you are not leaving the house dressed like that. And the child replies something to the effect of, you know what, you don't care about me. You must not love me. It's in those moments, you know, that you want to just kind of lovingly grab them. (laughs) And you want to lay on hands, right? (laughs) And you want to say, how dare you? How could you ever say that because you have no idea what I've sacrificed for you? You want to tell them I've sacrificed so much more for you than this tiny little thing that, you're, that I'm asking you to sacrifice for me. But friends, we do the same thing with God. 
we do the exact same thing with God. You don't love me, God, because otherwise you wouldn't make me go through this. You don't love me because if you did, you would remove this thorn from my flesh, but you won't. Little do we know that thorn is saving our soul. And God's response to us is the same as his response to Israel. He says, you have no idea what I've given up for you. You see, you don't realize that the most crucial deed of love that you need is not what you keep asking me to do for you, but it's something that I've already given to you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I can't get you out of my mind. No matter how many times you try to get me out of your mind, I never forget you. Friends, in ancient times, there were instances when they would put the name of a master on a servant because it would brand him as the master's. But friends, never was there ever a case when the, master, when the servant's name was placed on the master. Because you see, that would mean that the master was devoted to the servant. Don't you see? On Calvary, we see just how much the master was devoted to you and me. And the word engraved here in Hebrew actually means to engrave with a chisel or a spike. You see, this isn't just a metaphor that God has given us. It's not just some pat answer or nice words that don't do us any good. It's something tangible. It's something real. God has given us a person. Centuries ago, centuries ago, there was a disciple named Thomas. And you know, this question that we've been at, looking at today in verse 14 is the type of question Thomas would have asked. Okay, how do I know you love me? How do I know you care? You've disappeared. You've left us. You, 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 you've forsaken us. You've forgotten us. I won't believe you until you give me something tangible. Thomas is filled with doubt. He's filled with worry. He's filled with depression. And then Jesus shows up and he says, look at the palms of my hands. Thomas, you want something tangible. You want something you can deduce. Touch the nail scars in my hands. I want you to feel my love for you. I'm not just some God of talk. I'm a God of action. And so today, friends, maybe when you look inside yourself, you're thinking there is no way God is with me. There is no way God can ever possibly love me. Or maybe when you look at the circumstances in your life, you're thinking, there's no way God is with me. There's no way that, that he can possibly be for me or love me. Jesus' response to you is God is with you. Because on the cross, he was forsaken by the Father so that the Father will never forsake us. Don't worry about all the non-essentials because Jesus took care of your only real essential. And if he was willing to die for us, can't we be willing to trust him even if he asks us to do something we don't understand? I mean, think about that. If we understand his sacrifice for us, then we'll be willing to do what he asks us to do, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Okay, so you don't understand, my child, what's so big about one day of worship versus another day of worship, but because I died for you and I said this is the only day I wanted you to remember, then won't you remember it because I died for you? Okay, so you don't understand why I asked you not to do this and why I've asked you not to do that, but I died for you, so can't you just trust me? It's just like with our children, but infinitely times more. It's just like with that teenager. When we, when we get into those confrontations with our kids, you, you've seen everything that I've done for you. Won't you trust me? You think you need this, but you don't need this. You think you need that, but you don't need that. And yes, you do need to do this. Okay, you don't understand. Well, go to your room. Think about it. I love you. You'll figure it out later. Friends, in those moments when we feel lost and afraid, we're just like that restless infant before he gets a hold of the milk. Do you want to know what the milk is? The milk is you no longer have to be held captive by circumstance. The milk is you no longer have to be held captive by your feelings. 
Friends, the, the, the milk is you no longer have to be held captive by that flesh. You no longer have to be held captive by your money or your lack of it. You see, friends, we should never be defined by our circumstances. No, children of God should always be defined by the love Jesus showed us and by the love we show the world. First John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Today, my friends, allow this beautiful reality to swallow up any toxic feelings. Allow this reality to swallow up any negative heartache you might have. Look at what heaven gave up for you. And the next time you feel like God's denied you, remember that he died for you. The next time you feel like because I've sinned, he's left me. Remember, he said, I came and died for you. While you were yet sinners, I died for you. Man, he gave us the greatest things so that we'll trust him in the smaller things. So take a hold of that milk. When Israel said to God, Zion reminded us that you loved us, but now Zion's gone, so how do we know you love us? God responds, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. That's how. And now your walls are continually before me. You see, there was a time when God chose the temple to be the way that he dwelled with his people. But because Jesus has inscribed you on the palm of his hands, in Revelation 21.3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Is that good news today, friends? Friends, allow that to liberate you, I pray. Jesus, we want to thank you so much for this message. Lord, we want to thank you that that just as a mother cannot forget her child, you can never forget us. And Father, I pray that even those, maybe some of us haven't experienced a, a good relationship with our mom or with our parents, Lord, I pray that you would become the parent for them that they never had. Help them to see that you've given everything for them. You laid everything on the line for them. You laid your life on the line. That just as our parents have given us everything, they've poured themselves out for us, they've given us more than we can ever pay back. And so we, with our kids, sacrifice more than they'll ever pay us back. It's a little picture of the fact that what you've given us, we can never pay you back for. That salvation cannot be earned, but can only be accepted freely as a gift of grace. But as a result of experiencing that grace, Lord, we're going to trust you in the little things. That there's some things you've asked us to do and not to do for our own good. Not because you want to eliminate our joy, but because you want to give us greater joy you want to give us life and you want to give it more abundantly so lord i pray here with every eye closed and every head bowed lord that there are people here that are hurting lord i pray that between you and them that your holy spirit would work and that they would reach out and take that milk that you love them with an everlasting love and you've committed everything to them Help us to commit everything to you. Surrender, Lord. We want to surrender today. We don't want to be the same people we were when we got here. We want to be changed. Lord, we're just like those crying infants sometimes. We don't know what we're upset about. We're just upset, Lord. But then when we we taste the living water, we realize that's what I've been missing. Fill us up with the living water today, Father. Renew our strength, Lord. Give us hope where there's hopelessness. Give us trust where there is no trust. Give us boldness where we are frightened. Give us courage where we need it. And may we leave here as new people, reborn in the wondrous and precious blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.